Hello everybody and welcome back for another video in our operational series for Venue Live Sound Products. Today's topic is going to be input sharing and gain tracking. Now I'm going to make the assumption that uh, if you're here you already know that our consoles offer this feature. We, we initially offered it with S3LX and currently offer it with all the S6L offerings. Uh, so today that is going to be the topic du jour. So um, you know, there's been a fair amount of uh, confusion out there in the market about it. I've been answering a lot of questions on the internet and in social media. And, you know, frankly, it's to be expected. This is a new workflow for everybody, front of house, monitor guys, broadcast, everybody. Uh, so there's a lot of questions about it. So, you know, that was kind of the impetus for me putting this video together uh, was to be able to address all these questions and hopefully clear all this up for you because it's really a wonderful thing to have at your disposal to do this. Uh, so let's just jump right into it. There's a lot to cover here today. Uh, let me just uh, start off with the first diagram and we'll just jump right into it. All right, let's go. All right, so I think we'll start uh, with just a couple of block diagrams here to help you understand how our input gain control works. Because um, honestly, this is the, the key to unlocking all the mystery. Once you understand how the venue gain control works, uh, it, it unlocks all the mysteries of uh, input sharing and gain tracking, uh, our recording, uh, even virtual sound check. It'll reveal what we do there that's different from all of our competitors out there. All right. So we'll just jump right into a block diagram here and try to get this explained for you. All right. So what you see here is an actual block representation of our input control on the on the control surface. And as you can see here, the actual analog pre and the digital trim are separate from each other, uh, but they are all part of one gain control on the control surface. You can't control one without controlling the other. So the way this works uh, is that the analog pre is a stepped preamp. And in the case of S6L preamps, it is in one dB steps. However, in the case of the digital trim, it stepped in one tenth of a dB steps, and the two work together additively to try to equal this entire channel gain that is going to go into your input path, right? So let's uh, let's just have a look at how this might work with a let's just do a working example here. All right, so let's say we spin our input control up to 13.9 dB. All right, you see that on the channel strip as the as the full channel gain, and of course that uh, translates into 13.0 dB of analog pre and 0.9 dB of digital trim. Those two things are added together to create a total channel gain of 13.9 dB, right? Real simple. Now, you see Pro Tools down there, and you might be thinking, well, what kind of gain does Pro Tools get? How does that impact the record level? Well, Pro Tools takes its tap directly from the A to D converter pre-digital trim, right? So, of course, that translates into 13.0 dB of record gain. That is going to be our record level for the track. Right, so I can kind of hear your gears turning already. You're thinking, why did they separate those two things? Why are, why is it two different levels? Well, honestly, it'll only ever be 0.9 dB of difference maximum ever, right? So it's still still very acceptable in terms of record level. But here's the thing: if we can if we keep those two things separate, it plays right into our model for virtual sound check and for gain tracking. All right, and you'll see that as we go along. So just hang in there with me. Uh, the explanation is coming as we move along here. So let's move on to our next example. All right, let's take a look at what happens when we when we turn our input gain and we get past that 1 dB step of the analog pre and see how the whole thing reacts, okay? So let's just say we're in stage rack mode. We're going to turn this up to 14.5 dB now. Of course, that, that translates into 14 dB of analog pre. We've moved past a step, so we've added that dB of gain to the analog pre. And then, of course, that translates to 0.6 dB of digital trim, right? 13.9 plus 0.6 is all going to equal a new total gain number of 14.5 dB for our channel strip. Of course, we've moved up in that, uh, it, that analog pre-step uh, to 14 dB, so that's going to increase our record gain by 1 dB now as well, as you can see for the Pro Tools track. Okay, so I'm going to set this back to 13.9 now, and we're going to go look at what happens when we do that in virtual sound check mode, in playback mode. Okay, so let's set our gain setting back now, and we'll move on to virtual sound check mode here. All right, let's switch over to virtual sound check mode uh, now and take a look at how these recorded mic pre's react. 
And of course, this means uh, we no longer have the stage rack connected. And uh, so it is kind of great out here. And uh, we now have the Pro Tools machine as the source of audio coming into our channel. And of course, the first thing to note is uh, that this playback signal enters the path right above the digital trim. Uh, it essentially replaces the digitally converted analog pre. Also note that when, you, uh, when your console changes over to virtual sound check mode, your gain control actually changes modes as well. And it now reads, uh, in this instance, 0.9 dB, which represents the trim value that was part of the previous total gain number. Remember that? We were at 13.9, remember? Uh, that's added to the current playback level of 13.0 dB coming from our recorded track. Uh, and of course, that brings us back to our total number of 13.9 again, exactly as it was when we were using the mic pre from the stage rack. So from the listener perspective, and maybe just as importantly, the console perspective, there is no difference between the mic pre level and the playback level, right? Everybody's getting that. We, we still remain at that 13.9 total gain number. All right, so now let's, let's make a change to that gain knob uh, and see how the system reacts while it's in playback. Uh, let's make the same amount of change that we made before when, when we were using the stage rack and add 0.6 dB of trim here. Uh, now that actually represents, uh, you know, an aggregate change now of 1.5 dB to the trim, the original 0.9 plus the new 0.6 added to our recorded track gain of 13.0 dB, uh, giving us our, our new total playback gain of 14.5 dB into the channel, uh, just like we did when we were in the mic pre's, right? <clears throat> now, at this point, it's really tempting to ask this question, and, and I've gotten this from a number of people that I've explained this to before they stop here, and they, they usually get a little inquisitive and say, yeah, but what happens if you go back to the mic pre now, which is still sitting at 13.0 dB, doesn't the trim go back to the original 0.6 dB that it was in the stage rack mode? And, you know, honestly, this is kind of where uh, the cool part begins. This is where, uh, you know, Venue starts to separate itself from, from our competitors in terms of what it can do. Uh, in our system, you get to decide the answer to that question because uh, as you initiate the change back over to the stage rack, you get the following prompt. And I'm sure you guys have seen this. If you decline, then yes, that trim number goes back to the original. In this case, it would be the 0.6 dB. But if you're in virtual sound check, in this scenario, you more, way more often than not would want to choose apply. And by applying it, you now create a new total gain number for the channel of 14.5 dB when you're using the stage rack now, right? 13.9 13 dB of original settings plus the new 0.6 that was added during virtual sound check. So the thing to glean from this, which is crucially important for valid virtual sound check experiences in my opinion, is that with venue systems, you have the ability to accurately address input gain structure, which includes your mic pre while you're in playback. You get me on this? Please hear me on this because that's the vital difference here. And that's a big deal, folks. And frankly, it's a pretty advanced workflow, even by recording standards. Okay, so before we move on here now, I, I kind of feel compelled uh, to let you in on a little caveat uh, that you very much want to understand when you apply these changes uh, to that preamp uh, when coming out of virtual sound check. Uh, that process really is meant to be applied to a static or an unchanging gain setting, right? Uh, that, no, that new combo of preamp gain and trim that you just established will stay in place up until the point that you physically change it, or more importantly for this conversation, until you recall it uh, with a snapshot that has pre-scoped for any of the channels that you've changed, right? Uh, applying gain changes, changes coming out of VSC does not automatically update your snapshots that have stored total gain numbers for channels where you have pre-scoped. Uh, so because you have gain settings in these snapshots, you'll need to apply and store new gain settings in each of those snapshots if you need to make uh, a relative or even an absolute change while coming out of virtual sound check. All right. So 
I've kind of outlined a little procedure here for you to do it. Uh, let's just take a look at the screen here and I'll walk you through it. So um, let me get there. Here we go. So uh, the first thing you need to do is enter stage rack mode uh, for the snapshot you need to update. So if you have a, a snapshot or two or, or more that have gain changes, preamp gain changes in them, you're going to need to do this for each one of them. So enter stage rack mode for the snapshot you need to update. Then you're going to recall that snapshot that you, that you want to update. Then you're going to change over to virtual sound check for playback. All right, everybody got that? You're going to enter stage rack mode for the snapshot you need to update, recall the snapshot, then change over to virtual sound check for playback. Once you do that, then you enter playback or establish the new gain setting. If you know what it is ahead of time, just establish the new gain setting and now switch back to stage rack mode and choose apply to those changes. All right. So now once you've done that, you've applied them to this snapshot, but you still need to store it. Right. And I, I suggest you do that with update. You then want to update the currently loaded snapshot. Click update. Click pre in the parameter scope, choose the channels that you want to update, then click update again. All right. That will now update that snapshot. Rinse, lather, repeat for all the snapshots that are scheduled to have input gain changes. And remember, when you're done, update your show file so that all of those changes remain in your show file if you ever have to reload it again. All right. It sounds like a lot of steps. Believe me, with the instantaneous changeover for venue now between playback and stage racks, you can do this like that and be done with it. Okay, but it's important to remember that you need to do this if you've got preamp changes in your snapshots. Okay. Okay, let's move now uh, to the reason you tuned in here, which is to find out about how input sharing and gain tracking actually works. We're going to move to one more block diagram here, and then we'll move on to some real world cases with some real gear. All right. So in the diagram here, you can see that I've essentially replaced the Pro Tools path with a second console. Both consoles receive the digitally converted analog pre-signal and with the use of their respective trims actually create a total gain number for each console position. Now the key to understanding this is to know that only one console can make a trim change that actually moves the analog pre past its designated 1dB steps. Right? By definition, that console will be seen as the master. And either, either console can be the master. It doesn't really matter which one. You just got to decide ahead of time. But either, either one can be master in this scheme. So the secret sauce here is that these two trims actually communicate with each other. And there is a push-pull that takes place between them to affect each of their total gain values. This is done in order to be able to change the gain at one position and not disrupt the other position audibly in any way. And it's important to note here because it plays very importantly into how our systems work compared to other gain, gain track systems in the, in the market that each location, master and slave, has the full range of gain available to it regardless of whether the control is the master control or the slave control. Now, this is a subtle but really important difference between our system and many others out there where the slave console can actually run out of gain via a reduced available range that it has. So let's manipulate some gain here and show you what actually happens under the hood. Uh, let's say the master makes a significant change in level. Uh, let's say he makes a full 6 dB increase in level at, at his gain stage here or his gain control. Well, as we've learned in the, in the past here, that would actually cause the analog pre to move a full six steps up to 19.0 dB. And in this case, our trim would actually go unchanged, right? Uh, for a total master channel gain of 19.9 dB as indicated on the gain control itself. So what happens to the slave when you do this? Well, visibly, and more importantly, maybe audibly, no change, right? Nothing happens there. You're, you're impervious to it. But underneath the hood, the trim has actually experienced a full 6 dB change, keeping the audible level at the desired 13.9 dB. Okay, let's reverse the role now, and uh, let's, let's have the slave actually make the big gain change. And in this case, let's, let's go the other direction. Let's have the slave console actually decrease his gain by 6 dB. That change is clearly visible on his gain control. He can see that he's reduced at 6 dB. 
And in actuality, the slave console has done nothing more than decrease his digital trim by 6 dB. And of course, uh, that of course has no effect on the analog pre or even on the, the master's trim control, leaving the master completely unaware that you as the slave console have made that change. Uh, but you just get your new total gain uh, range of 7.9 dB, right? Uh, it's really just that straightforward, uh, guys. But it, it does, however, get a little more complex, uh, complicated and complex when we add Pro Tools recorders to both the master and the slave positions uh, in this shared scheme, especially if we're going to be doing virtual sound check at both positions, right? And that is what I'll focus on next. Uh, we're going to move on to some real equipment examples here. I've actually got a pair of systems uh, locked together in this scheme, including Pro Tools systems. And we're going to do this in real time and actually have a look at what that looks like. All right. So let's go there now. Okay, let's take a look at the connection scheme that I'm going to be using today so you can kind of get your head wrapped around uh, what we're going to be talking about and showing today. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, for this demo, I'm going to be making use of a couple of S3LX consoles I have here, plus a couple of Mac Minis running Pro Tools uh, to be able to demonstrate both gain tracking, recording, and playback. Um, and as you can see, this is our redundant loop connection scheme for the AVB network. Uh, in this case, the Pro Tools machines are actually connected to port C on the engine. Uh, and that's just because I don't really have S3 surfaces here that I have in play for this demonstration. I'm just using the, the engine, the stage racks, and the Pro Tools. Uh, but when you do have an S3 in play, obviously at that point you would want to connect Pro Tools to the surface, the second port of the surface, and then connect your S3 to port C on the E3 engine. And then uh, uh, work with it from there, just as you see in the diagram here. Now, just to be clear, even though I'm demonstrating uh, today with S3LX, this is exactly the same setup and process that you would use for S6L consoles as well. However, in the case of S6L, there's actually a dedicated Pro Tools port on the uh, S6L control surface. Uh, and really, you should always use that uh, for your AVB connection to Pro Tools. All right. All right, let's take a look at the screens I'm going to be using to demonstrate this. And... Uh, you know, just to help keep a familiar picture and language of what I'm referring to during this demo, I'm going to call one system an FOH system and one system a monitor system. Uh, this would likely be the most common scenario uh, you'd see here for this type of configuration. But of course, uh, it could be a front of house and broadcast console, monitor and broadcast uh, streaming, however you choose to use it. Uh, and here you can see an FOH console channel. And you can see that it's the master of our scheme today. And that's kind of reinforced with its patch indicator uh, being green in color. That's how we show the master in, the, in these systems. Uh, below it, we have the monitor console, and it's the slave console in our scheme today. And that is shown by its patch indicator being kind of a yellow-orange color. That's the color scheme we use to show slave. Now, it's worth noting uh, that as you can see in each window, the master has access to the 48 volt switch as well as the pad. And of course, that's because the master is addressing the actual analog pre, as you're now aware. And of course, those controls would not be accessible by the slave console per our previous uh, discussion and uh, conversations here. So to the right of the master S3L, you can see the Pro Tools system that is connected to it. And to save some confusion, I've given that track a green color to indicate it's connected to the FOH or the master console. And of course, below that, we have the Pro Tools machine that is connected to the monitor console, which is, uh, in this case, again, the slave console. And I've set it up to follow the uh, slave color scheme as well. So I'm going to start with both consoles in kind of a default state uh, with both their input gains all the way down, uh, just as if we were starting uh, a line check or a sound check, okay? All right, so for the purposes of this demo, uh, you know, I'm going to try to keep it really simple here uh, in the hope of making it easy to follow along. So to begin with, uh, let's leave the recording aspect of this alone for a second and just focus on input sharing and game tracking with regard to the consoles. I'm just going to use some simple pink noise as our uh, signal source and plug it into channel one of the stage rack. And the idea here is to show something you know, that is consistent and repeatable and makes the system reactions very easy to see. 
And as you can see, the noise is coming in at pretty low level. I, you know, I'm trying to simulate mic level here at around minus 30. And, you know, to begin here, I think I really want to drive home just how nimble our design is uh, by actually setting the gain first on the slave. And as I mentioned earlier in the, in the presentation, you can see that both master and slave settings are actually starting out in the same position here. Uh, you know, the only thing that would need to be uh, initially addressed by the master would be if the source required 48 volt phantom, uh, you know, that it kind of be established by the master console before you start. But once that's done, everybody can start setting gain. Okay, here we go. Um, you know, I'm just going to use gain guess to set the slave gain. Uh, no big secret here. We're just going to press on the gain guess button until it flashes a couple of times and have it set the level. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. And notice the signal has come right up to 0 dB RMS, and the slave console can now actually go to work and start distributing that signal around the console. Nothing had to happen uh, by the master console in order to get my line check underway except establishing phantom power if needed. Okay, now let's go set the gain at the master. And again, we'll use gain guess to do this. Uh, you know, it's just how I do it. So, you know, it's, if you want to do it that way too, you can do it manually with the knob, doesn't matter. All right, and uh, you see it comes right up to zero dB RMS as well. And now we have the proper input settings on the master and can go to work there as well. But most importantly, notice that nothing appeared to change on the slave console when I did that. Uh, its gain did not change, right? But in actuality, uh, what did change was its ratio of analog preamp gain to its trim. But that happens invisibly to the slave engineer, you know, both visually and audibly. Yeah. Now, of course, the flip side of this is also true, right? And you have to be aware of this. Uh, let's consider what happens if the master console inadvertently adds tons of gain to that analog pre. Matter of fact, overdrives it into distortion. Matter of fact, I'd, you know, I'm going to make this really exaggerated here. I'm just going to grab uh, the gain knob and turn it all the way up here. So, obviously, the front of house console is distorting the analog pre, but note what's happening down at the slave console, right? The slave is not seeing that distortion because it has enough gain to do the actual push-pull there, uh, you know, th that is in place. Uh, but it, believe me, it's distorted for him, right? So, you know, it, it's something that you have to be aware of. You have to be conscious of this when you set gain. Honestly, it's the reason I always suggest to people use gain guess to set your gain because it's repeatable then. I mean, even for the, in this instance, if I had accidentally done this at the master, what I can do right now is just simply go and gain guess again and have it go right back where it was, right? So that's right where I set it additionally. I can get right back where I was. So I use it really to set gains on all of my inputs when I'm setting show files, and it works uh, just as well, if not better, when you're doing um, uh, you know, input sharing and gain tracking as well. All right? Okay, so let's, uh, let's get our recorders back into the picture here. Um, you know, let's start by defaulting our input gains back to their initial state uh, before we gain guess them into position. So you can kind of see how setting gain is going to impact the record level uh, and your subsequent playback. All right, so let's get those back to all the way down here. Do that. So remember what we discussed in the initial block diagrams for the recording at the beginning of the video. The signal to the recorder is taken directly from the A to D conversion of the analog pre but before the digital trim. And uh, it's super important to note this, that all that holds true for all recorders on the network, not just the local recorder, right? Uh, so as you can see here in our, you know, in our scheme, we have two Pro Tools recorders that are sitting on this AVB network, and both of them are gonna get their signal from that analog pre. And of course, when we move back to playback, both machines will then inject their audio right above each console's digital trim. So just to emphasize that point, even though there is a Pro Tools system attached to the Mon console, because it's the slave, its gain settings have no impact on the actual record level, even though the recorder is locally attached. So let's prove that here with a little real world challenge. Uh, I, I'm gonna go ahead and roll the recorders. Let's go ahead and get them in record. So I'm gonna move up to my uh, master machine here, get him in record ready. 
And then my slave machine, do the same thing. And off we go. Okay, so you can see both machines are in record now and they're capturing the, the existing mic pre-levels. All right, so um, we're going to go to the slave machine and set gain again. Again, just to help reemphasize what's actually happening with these systems. I'm just going to gain guess it again. Just put it right back where it was. So here we go. Okay, there you see the gain coming up in the monitor console there. He's got his operating gain now where he can go to work. But notice there was no change in the record level there, right? Even though that machine's connected locally to him, it did not change his record level. All right, so let's go up to the master now and do that. We're going to gain guess again there and just set that level. And voila. And of course, you notice that the gain comes right up there on both machines. That's proving that both of those machines are getting their gain from that analog pre. Uh, and that master console is actually setting the record level for both machines. Okay. All right, so we've been recording along here, but uh, let's say after a short period of time, the monitor engineer says, hey, you know what? I, I don't want to run my input gain that high. It, it, in, for my gain structure, maybe I just need to run my input lower. So he decides to you know, reduce his input gain, let's say by 15 dB. We'll just make it exaggerated here. All right, so I'm going to reduce his input gain here by 15 dB. And of course, as you would expect, nothing has happened to the record gain here, right? But it's no problem. There's no penalties to the recording. Uh, he's just doing this because he's simply working with his new ratio of digital trim to analog pre now, right? Uh, in actuality, he's just adjusting his trim, uh, even though it feels and acts just as if he is fully in control of the pre. And so the question that regularly comes up now is, okay, so what happens then during playback when the monitor engineer switches to virtual sound check? Won't his playback level be wrong? And of course, the answer is no, right? Because both systems, regardless of whether they receive audio from the preamp or the recorded track, which, as you'll recall, with regard to the level, is identical to the analog pre, are working against their localized to uh, total gain number, right? They're still working on that total gain number. All right, so let's, uh, let's just switch both consoles over to virtual sound check mode and verify that, all right? So I'm going to do that here. I'm going to hit stop on these machines. Uh, and we're going to go into virtual sound check on both machines. I'm going to actually take this out of record ready. And this out of record ready so that we make sure and play back. And we're going to switch uh, front of house over first to virtual sound check. Then we'll switch monitors over to virtual sound check. Remember now we have an expectation of a level coming back on that monitor console of uh, about, uh, you know, plus 15 or something in the gain. It should look exactly like it did when we left, right? So uh, I'm going to go back to the area where we actually established the preamp level. and go from there. And as you can see, uh, both machines are playing back exactly as they were uh, when they were on live microphones. And so again, from the perspective of gain, neither front of house or monitor console really knows whether it is listening to the mic pre or the recorded track, right? Okay, you've seen how input sharing and gain tracking actually works now, uh, along with networked recording. Uh, but there is a caveat that I have to explain to you now and make you aware of, okay? Uh, and this revolves around if you have a system, let's say specifically your master system, uh, that is making input changes, uh, input gain changes throughout the night. Maybe it's manually or maybe if it's with snapshot, uh, whatever. Uh, uh, the impact that that is going to have on that slave console when it goes to virtual sound check. Uh, there is a caveat that's involved here that you must know about, all right? So let's take a look at that. So let's say, as I described earlier, that the master console is going to be making a series of snapshotted changes uh, to its input gain for, the, uh, for a given number of inputs because the input sources are going to be changing volume all night long in, in a predictable way, right? You might see this a lot with, uh, let's say, for a keyboard player, for example, 
where throughout the set of songs uh, for your band, they might be changing keyboard levels. So let's kind of simulate that here now. All right, um, let's, okay, let's say we're gonna work with a three song set. We'll, we'll keep it nice and short just for demonstration purposes here. And in that set, our keyboard player has three different output levels uh, from his keyboard that we want to account for. So let's say this was his line check level that we're looking at right now, right? So for this, you know, obviously both consoles want to optimize this for this. So we're going to gain guess both consoles. And of course, we'll start with the front of house console here. We'll get him in line. Then we'll jump down to the monitor console, who is the slave. We'll get him in line. And so now that's kind of our sound check level, right? So now we're going to move into, uh, maybe we're at sound check, whatever. We're going to move through all the songs and check these levels and get these things set. Uh, so let's have the keyboard player uh, play his first song, and we'll get a sense of that line or, or that level. And as you can see, it's much lower uh, than our, uh, our line check level. So the front of house engineer, kind of being a good steward of gain, says, hey, I'm going to account for that. I'm going to make a snapshot that accounts for this gain change and actually get the record level right. So he goes ahead and gain guesses again. And now he stores that in a snapshot. Now, as you can see, the monitor engineer's gain did not change. Matter of fact, he's kind of he has a very different mindset possibly even here. He just says, hey, that's where the keyboard player wants to hear it. That's the level he wants to hear it at. I'm just going to leave it alone. And he, you know, maybe after watching this video, right, he also realizes, hey, it has no impact on the recording level. I'm just working with the stage level here, so this is all okay. So he leaves it alone. All right, so, you know, that's all cool, right? We're going to, he stored his snapshot. We're going to move on to the next song and check out what happens there, right? Now we've got a lot more level. Uh, so, you know, the, as has been known to happen, right, it it's actually jumps up in the next song. So in this point, at this point, the front of house guy goes, yep, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to account for gain here again. I'm going to regain the asset level. I'm going to store a new snapshot. Monitor guy says, yep, no problem. I'm going to leave it right there for the, uh, for the player. And let's move on to the next song. So we go to the next song. And sure enough, level's way down on this one. Front of house guy again goes through the same process. He gain guesses. Uh, stores that in his snapshot, and uh, monitor engineer leaves it alone. Okay, so now we get to showtime. We're going to go ahead and record all of this, and uh, you know, and take a look at what happens either you know maybe after sound check or maybe after the show, possibly the next day when both of these consoles go to virtual sound check now and see what happens then. Okay, so let's uh, go ahead and start our show. We're going to have our recorders in play here. And we're going to have the master work through these snapshots. The monitor engineer is going to be doing his show just as he did during sound check. And we'll see how this all comes out here. All right. So uh, now remember, the monitor engineer is allowing for all of those input level changes to actually happen from the instrument. And he's not accounting for that at all. But the front of house engineer is. All right. So front of house engineer recalls his first snapshot. And sure enough, there's our level. Optimize there. We see the input level go down for the monitor engineer. We move on to the next song. And again, optimized level from the front of house position, changing level for the monitor engineer from the keyboard. And then, of course, we move to our third song and same sort of deal, much lower level at the monitor console and optimized level for the front of house position. All right, so now we're going to go to playback. We're going to go to virtual sound check mode on both consoles and take a look at how this plays back on both of these consoles, right? So um, first thing we got to do, obviously, is get our machines in playback ready. So we're going to take them out of record ready. I take them, unarm these tracks. And we're going to put our consoles in virtual sound check mode, meaning ready for playback. And then we're just going to go to song one and we're going to hit play here. Now, remember, what we're expecting to see here is obviously the optimized level for the front of house console. That's, he's recalling these snapshots and, and has set up for that. But the monitor console is expecting to see exactly the same changes made from the keyboard originally uh, at his console. So when we hit play here, let's take a look at what we see. And on the monitor console, we actually see the expected level. Uh, because remember, this was the first song after the initial setting of gain. So you could actually be fooled into thinking everything is okay here. Now we go to song two 
and check it out. Same level for the monitor console, the optimized level for the front of house console, which is incorrect for the monitor console. And in song three, same thing, right? We get the optimized level as a result of that front of house snapshot, but we get a consistently wrong level for the monitor console, okay? So obviously this is not what we want to happen uh, and it, I need to make you aware of it uh, through showing this. Uh, and the reason this is happening uh, is actually pretty simple and understandable. And hopefully you get it now that you've been through this presentation. And it is simply because the track is now the source of the audio, but it is not the source of the gain tracking, right? The gain tracking mechanism is only in play when the stage racks are the source of audio. All right, guys, so the takeaway I can share with you here with regard um, to this challenge is this. First off, if you have uh, a situation where you can have fixed input gains at that master console, right, then meaning unchanging, right? We set it once, we gain guess it once, what, however you want to do it, but it, it doesn't change throughout our show. If that's the case for you, then this input shared, gain tracked, networked recording system will just work a charm for you. Both locations, you know, master and slave, will be able to virtually uh, sound check and have it be completely valid and work for you. But if you have a situation where you have dynamically changing input gains at that master console, whether it's by a manual change or by snapshot change, either one, then you know, obviously, you see the challenge now with with uh, validating the virtual sound check for the slave console for those inputs that have a changing input gain. So with that in mind, I have two options for you, right? Now, the first option seems overly simple and may not fully address what you need to do, but it is the reality of the situation. If you're in a situation where you need that kind of dynamically changing input gain and you need to virtual sound check at both the master and the slave location, then my suggestion to you really is to you know, change your system design. Go back to discrete stage racks. Go back to discrete recorders and handle it that way. Uh, you know, that, that is going to give you the most flexibility and the most reliability in terms of you know, operating the workflow and not making mistakes. Right Now, if that is just physically not a possibility for you, maybe you're working on an already installed system, etc., and you still need to manage this workflow in the way that we've described here, then I have a second option for you, and I'm going to walk you through the steps of how to do this on a day-to-day -day basis. The, the procedure is actually very similar to what I described earlier in this video, uh, where you are making snapshot changes, and you need to apply those changes on a per snapshot basis. It's going to be similar to that. So we're going to switch back over to PowerPoint for one second here, and I'm going to walk you through this procedure, all right? All right, folks, so I, I've put together a little procedure for you here. Uh, to help you through this process, uh, you know, until we get this, this challenge kind of solved for you guys. So follow along with me here. First thing to make sure of is that both systems are on and connected for input sharing and gain tracking. All right. Obviously, if you're in an installed situation, this is much easier to accomplish. If you're in a touring situation, you just need to make sure both systems are up, uh, have the proper show file loaded, are on, and are in input and gain sharing connection, right? Next, you need to ensure the master console has completed its virtual sound check. You want him to go first. You want to get that done and out of the way before you move on to virtual sound checking the slave console. Then you want to ensure both systems are in stage rack mode when you are ready to start at the slave console. Both systems have to be in stage rack mode because we're going to use that gain tracking mechanism that happens while you're in stage rack mode to get the slave console ready for these changing gains. On the master, you want to then recall the song or the snapshot that has the uh, input gain settings in it. Uh, get whatever song you want to do on the slave console, they have to recall that on the master first. Then you're, once it's done, once it's recalled, then you want to change the slave console over to virtual sound check mode, right? Because it's now got the right ratio of preamp slash recorded track to trim. Then you're going to make the necessary adjustments on the slave console and store it as needed. And then switch the slave console back over to stage rack mode, right? Uh, you're going to do this for every snapshot uh, that has gain changes, input gain changes at the master console in order to virtual sound check at the slave console and keep the gain valid. 
then you just like, like I say, you're just going to repeat those steps, those those three through seven that you see here for every song that the slave needs to virtual sound check. And then, of course, update your show files uh, when you're complete. Right. So that it all comes back if you had to reload that show file. So, you know, this is this is something obviously it's a little clunky uh, to have to kind of do this thing. You know, it's just one of the penalties that we have right now uh, in place for input. Uh, sharing and game tracking with both consoles needing to virtual sound check. I'm sure we're going to come up with a solution for this at some point. Uh, but until then, if you need to do that, this is kind of the procedure for doing it. Okay, guys, that's the story on input sharing, game tracking, networked recording, and virtual sound check. All right. Uh, so obviously we have a couple of caveats, but as I mentioned earlier in the uh, in this video, you know, every time we take on one of these big challenges, these big interconnect and workflow challenges and conquer it, invariably a couple of other challenges bubble up right out of that. And this is really a textbook case of that here. So hang in there with us. We're well aware of it. Uh, we have the guys on it working on the best solution we can come up with for it. And we will get that out to you in the market as soon as we can here. So thanks for tuning in today. Thanks for tuning in on another venue operational video. If you need more information on Avid and Venue and Pro Tools, please check in at www.avid.com. We'll see you next time, guys. Thanks a ton. We'll see you. Bye-bye.